Hey everyone, back again. Now we're going to continue on with Edward Said's The Question of Palestine with chapters 1 and 2. And then the next episode we'll, showed, we'll finish off with chapters 3 and 4. And hi, if you're new here, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. But go and listen to the first part in which I cover a uh, brief history of Zionism, the introduction, and the preface, which are all super important. And you'll get the other spiel. Follow me on other platforms if you want to help out. Consider instead donating to one of the organizations I've linked below. Uh, any, any and all help is greatly appreciated by me and to all the people you will be helping. Now, I'm, I mean, I'm recording this just days after Israel uh, murdered a bunch of uh, World Kitchen employees from across the globe, and this has sparked international outcry, as it should. Um, and the thing about that, I mean, the many things about that is that how 30,000, more than 30,000 civilians can die with not the same kind of outcry, which isn't to diminish the severity of this uh, horrendous act of violence that Israel will now investigate for a crime it committed. Imagine if any other country committed a crime and then they were tasked to perform the investigation into that crime. Inter very interesting uh, situation. I'm sure that there's very legitimate legal reasons for that, that I, me, I obviously would just never understand. So if anyone wants to explain it, I'd love to hear about it. And after my last episode, I got a number of comments, reviews, and uh, messages about my emotionality behind it, my, how <laughs> I don't let the story or the story, Edward Said's words speak for themselves, and instead, you know, insert too much of my opinion or too much of how I feel about things, which I just find so absurd. Like, I don't know how, how anyone is supposed to be quote unquote objective or to just assume a neutral tone in the face of these horrific, horrendous acts. Uh, and it just, it, it, yeah. And others as well commenting uh, about why I'm concerned about this. And my concern is not just with Israel's violent actions against uh, Palestinians for the last hundred years, 75 years, uh, but the, you know, Jewish uh, settlements in Palestine, even before the formation of Israel, of course. It's also because knowing that my government, like Canada, even though they have since claimed to be, to stop sending arms to Israel has been funding Israel for a long time. And I'm currently in the US and how they are funding Israel. So it's like, I feel a certain compulsion that as a citizen of at least one of those countries to speak up. And the last thing I wanna say before jumping into it is that after this text, I'm gonna be covering Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, which I actually haven't read before. And it might be one of the texts that I've been lied to the most about in my life in knowing about it and hearing about it, where you know, you're often told about Eichmann in Jerusalem, you're told about the banality of evil, how the big point of that text is that Eichmann was just a regular dude and people use this to point to the fact that anyone could be an architect of a Holocaust, another Holocaust, and participate in eradicating six million or more of a, of a specific population, uh, like, like as what happened with the Jewish people in Nazi Germany and Poland and, and other places, like because Auschwitz was in Poland, uh, all of these other places. Um, but the thing about that text though, is that no one ever unpacks what exactly Hannah Arendt meant when she described Eichmann as being just a normal dude. It's a term we hear and we're like, oh, obviously she just meant like a dude who had, you know, maybe a wife and 2.3 kids and the white picket fence and the house, just a regular dude, could have been your neighbor. When actually, what she means by the norm was just how normal Zionism was at the time and how Eichmann was very much a committed Zionist. Very interesting, this is, this is a detail that's often omitted when this text is spoken about. So I'm gonna present that next time, so, or the next text I cover, so stay tuned for that. But yeah, let's jump into chapter one of the question of Palestine. So he begins by recounting Europe's view, their historical view of the Orient. And in here, he's referring to the Orient as he does in his text, Orientalism, where he's referring to the Arabic speaking Muslim world. He recounts Europe's view of the Orient as simply an undifferentiated mass 
mostly of colored people. It was defined largely as everything that Europe apparently was not. That is, it was branded as being childish, in its development unenlightened, backwards, hypersexual, uh, being deceitful and, and riddled with deception, whereas, and superstitious, stuck in tradition, whereas Europe was this shining beacon of enlightenment and glory and discipline, yet freedom. And all of these things really fly in the face of history, really, because I, I don't know if you recall, but I think the Holocaust happened in Europe and not in the Middle East. You know, the Holocaust, the most, one of the, if not the most, horrendous demonstrations of violence and quote-unquote backwardness that I think we've ever seen. So his idea about Orientalism is to say that Europe has created this category of the Orient, and they had whole departments in their in colleges to study it, whole the whole like uh, political departments also dedicated to understanding the Orient to justify Europe's encroachment upon that, those territories in Egypt, and then this would, for example, and then this would play out with the West's. Um, ability to expand into Afghanistan and Iraq and with all the many conflicts that emerged there in the in the late 20th century and in all of this Palestine plays a very specific and important role in the orientalist fantasy the idea of the orient that is Palestine is framed as this non-place it's framed as it was often by Zionists as we read you know passages of from the last episode it was framed as this place that's just empty, you know, just, just ripe for colonial expansion, for Jews to just go and settle in because there's no one there. Oh, there might be a few inhabitants, but they won't mind sharing the land, like as though there was no structure there, as though there was nothing worth defending. Very similar argument, of course, was leveled against indigenous people. And we find that in thinkers like John Locke, in his justification for colonialism, which asterisk he doesn't outwardly um, justify colonialism. He just says that, oh, well, people who only work on the land in the right kind of way actually deserve that land. And we see then that uh, the colonialists using that logic to justify stealing indigenous people's land. Moreover, this was done under the auspices or with the justification of manifest destiny. And manifest destiny, for those of you that don't know, was the idea that uh, the Americas were... Europe's God-given right. European countries, the British and the French, had a God-given right to expand into these areas, into the Americas. Doesn't matter who was there. Doesn't matter, matter how many people they eradicated. They could just do whatever they wanted. And I remember so vividly learning about how horrible that was as a child, like in elementary school. And I, I really struggled to see the difference between that and uh, or the early Zionist treatment of Palestine. They were treating it as though it was their God-given right to that place, and so therefore they can go and do whatever they want to the inhabitants. Doesn't matter that they displaced nearly a million people. It didn't matter that they shoved them in refugee camps for decades, ripped them out of their homes, murdered tens of thousands of them, uh, tens of thousands of them over the years. Doesn't matter because it's their land. Apparently, it's uh, Israel's land. But by framing Palestine, viewing Palestine as this non-place, it really fit within the Orientalist vision of the Middle East as being a place that's undeveloped, therefore just worthy of being colonized and exploited, where Palestinian national, cultural, and social identity has been repeatedly denied as though to make them as ambiguous as Europe views the overall Orient. Why is it, though, so easy for Palestinian identity to be reified, to be elevated, to be made a public spectacle, when they are associated with terrorism, then suddenly there, there are real people with real goals, just, just chaos and terror, apparently. But when it comes to self-determination and autonomy, then suddenly, oh, oh no, 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 no. They're, they don't have a clear goal or agenda. They, what is Palestine? It's not even a place, you know? It was barely even recognized as a country internationally. So we see a kind of hypocrisy on display there, how claims towards Palestinian national identity are used 
to undermine that identity by just associating it with terror and how in other cases it's used uh, or denied in order to uh, in order to further justify encroachment on those territories. And I know I recommended watching Israelism, um, and I know that I know how problematic it is to to be recommending uh, non-Palestinian sources of information right now. But for those of you who like are interested in seeing firsthand firsthand on a on a screen what life is like in the juxtaposition between let's say you're a cool hip kid in Tel Aviv and a few miles away you know people suffering miserably in Gaza you could watch Anthony Bourdain's episode on it uh which obviously I know is problematic but it is just so fully apparent in that episode uh, when he, he just visits, uh, he visits Gaza and Israel, just how much oppression Gazans and then people even in the West Bank are under daily. The kinds of discrimination they experience on a daily basis, how they are endlessly harassed by the IDF arbitrarily, how there are checkpoints, they can't even move through their own, their own country without being stopped randomly by this occupying force i don't know it, any americans here i would love to know how many of you would be cool with that with uh, i would lo- really love to know how many of you would be like yes this is exactly what i want of course this would be amazing for me but yeah i mean it's from the anthony bourdain series titled parts unknown and the uh, episode from 2013 is i think it's just called jerusalem but he visits obviously east and west jerusalem and the West Bank and Gaza, and it's, I mean, it's disgusting. But these efforts to brand Palestine as this non-place, you know, it does all the things I mentioned, but it also just erases their rich cultural history, their their food, their music, their knowledge-producing institutions, which have perpetually been under attack by Israel. There's a, I mentioned it last time, but Maya Wynn's recent book, uh, Towers of Ivory and Steel, looks at the systematic ways in which Israel has targeted with bombs, <laughs> targeted Palestinian uh, colleges, universities, and has undermined their research and has essentially within Israel, like, of course, they don't teach about this. Uh, this is just the systematic way in which entire histories are erased by going after the knowledge producing institutions. Now, many of us don't know this, but it was just viewed as flat out a- anti-Semitism to even mention Palestine in the early to mid 20th century, even to say that word was branded as being anti-Semitic, even though it was it, people from Thomas Hobbes to <laughs> Hannah Arendt, like everywhere in between, so many people knew that area as Palestine. That's just what, ex- that's just what the world knew. But then, uh, and even then, when the UN's vote recognizing Palestinian right to self-determination in 1969, was thus, it was like a radical transformation for the world to recognize Palestine as as having self-determinative capacity and autonomy, which at the, it's not as though uh, the claims of of charges of anti-Semitism went away if anyone has sided with Palestine. You still see it today, where if you criticize Israel, you are, uh, you are anti-Semitic, you know, but that's, I mean, that's the state of the world right now. Now, all this isn't to say that Palestine was purely an Arabic Muslim nation for all of its history. Like, in the early 20th century, 10-15% of its population was Jewish, just like I mentioned last time, like in other nations as well. I mean, and it was their home, like it was their their place. And, you know, if we add this fact that it was 10%, 10-15% Jewish, it's really strange that the early Zionists framed it as... Uh, a land without people for a people without land. That is Jewish people who didn't have a home. And it would be their home when there are Jewish people living there. I mean, what does that what does that say about the, even the early Zionist view of Jews living there at the time? As though it wasn't even theirs. Like as though it, it would just be taken over. And this is like one of the many ways that Zionism participates in anti-Semitism. As, you know, I'm sure jarring as that is to hear where, and I keep seeing this, if a Jewish person criticizes Zionism, 
then they're, you know, they're branded as a self-hating Jew or, or anything like that. This is certainly something that Hannah Arendt experienced and continues to experience with like smear pieces written in Israeli sponsored um, news outlets, you know, essentially disowning uh, Hannah Arendt. And like, I mean, it's just me. I can't, I can't speak for everyone. But if I had a real, like, if I was a religious person and somebody was trying to reduce my religion, my attachment to the divine, to the cosmic order of all infinite beings on the planet, if somebody was trying to reduce that to a nation, I, I would, I, it would really bother me. It would really bother me. While I think it's also important to recognize, as we can, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about anti-Semitism as we go on here, recognizing that there might be material historical reasons for Jewish people to have some kind of a protective apparatus, given not just the Holocaust, but the millennia of persecution that Jews experienced way before then. Both of these things can be true. So many people knew about uh, Palestine. Like I said, you had Thomas Hobbes, you also had uh, Lamartine, uh, or Lamartine. People, I don't, I, people sometimes are so... So weird when I pronounce words in French, like Descartes, they're like, why are you pronouncing it like that? I'm like, if that's his name, they're like, no, okay. <laughs> or Descartes, as some like to hear, not, God forbid you say Descartes. Uh, but Lamartine, if you prefer, Lamartin, uh, Disraeli, Mark Twain, they all wrote about Palestine and aren't. Like, like, it was just a thing. People knew it. In 1978, the Rothschild's memorandum uh, from our Lord Rothschild's memorandum speaks of the principle that Palestine should be reconstituted as the national home of the Jewish people, just acknowledging that it is a place, some a national identity, a land that is not even their own, that Jewish people have this uh, kind of God-given right to. Now, the language of reconstituting and rebuilding reveals their colonial aspirations to dare to tear down and transform Palestine. And this is central to Edward Said's uh, approach to this in that all of the ways, or many, I can't say all, many of the ways that Zionist movements into Palestine were framed, they were framed in a way that branded Palestine as needing correction, as needing investment as needing to be torn down and reconstituted for an enlightened people. And so Israel has been steadily and surely trying to erase all traces of Palestinian people on the land there before uh, 1948 and after, uh, you know, in the four years uh, after Israel occupied Palestine, that is in 67, it destroyed more than 15,000 homes. In 1948, nearly a million lost their homes, villages, and communities. And, you know, with it, yeah, I can't even imagine what that's like. Like, what that does to your support system, what it does to your sense of community, what it does to your attachment to the world to be, to be displaced like that. Many of whom were thrown into Lebanon. Many of, whom, many of them had to just flee to Jordan or Egypt. And the... <laughs> These efforts, these exiles, were often just justified as like, oh, well, they didn't like Jews, so they left. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, you're destroying their homes and taking taking their land. Like, what, what else are they going to do? Many of them were just forced to leave. Now, in its conquest, Israel received overwhelming support from the U.S. and the U.K. Now, it has to be noted that Israel and the U.K. had a fraught relationship after World War II because it was it was still British territory. It was, it was British land, and Jewish people were like, oh, no, this is ours now. So there were, there were quite a few tensions, actually, between the British and Israel, and I think that that often gets ignored, even though uh, the British were in large part responsible for siphoning Jews there uh, after World War II, as were the Nazis, but before World War II, up until about 1941, were Nazis, many of them, Eichmann included, responsible for sending Jews to Palestine. But stick around for the Hannah Arendt and you'll learn all about that history if you didn't know about it, because I didn't. Funny how these, it's funny what things we learn about in history class. In any case, Israel had support from the West. 
and this support allowed their population to grow uh, at about 30 percent per year in 1927 because Jewish settlements in in Palestine were happening much before World War II and in 1927 their their increase in the number of people was about 30 percent per year whereas the normal quote-unquote normal regular increase of a population in any given territory is like I mean territory any anywhere is like one and a half to two percent so it's 30 percent that's because the british and then a little later the nazis were sending many 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 jewish people to palestine and this was largely motivated or or justified under the belief that arabic people and muslim people were just subhuman they didn't deserve the land and you can just send you could send hordes of europeans there and it doesn't matter because they didn't you know, they didn't know how to, what to actually do with their land. There were no buildings, or at least in their, in their eyes. Uh, and so therefore, they had no real claim to it. And therefore, they had a vested interest in erasing Palestinian presence and resistance to Zionist encroachment because they feared the international community would side with the Palestinians, as we see today. I mean, after October 7th, with Hamas's brutal attack in Israel... I think that we can confidently say that this has elevated global consciousness about the state of Palestine, about what life has been like for the last 75 years and more living in Palestine, be it in Gaza or the West Bank. And when people have learned about it, we're seeing the international community overwhelmingly oppose it and turn against Israel. We're seeing it at the pol political level. We're seeing it on the, the civilian level seeing at the cultural, social, academic level, and yet Israel is allowed to continue. But the, I mean, I don't want <laughs> to celebrate this too much, but at least global consciousness about this has, has been rising. And again, if you want more on this, like I definitely recommend you checking out my episodes on Necropolitics by Mbembe and uh, Wiseman's Lethal Theory. And then in a few weeks, Eichmann in Jerusalem and how it's really interesting that Eichmann, who committed crimes against humanity in Germany, would be tried in Israel as a means to justify Israel's existence, all the while silencing Palestinians, or all the while ignoring uh, all of the violences inflicted against Palestinians in the name of Zionism, or in the name of Jewish resettlement in Palestine. Now, Zionism was largely approved by in the West, and Edward Said is like, it, it's so obvious because in the West, they had such a poor view of Muslims in the Arabic world. The, the entire history of Orientalism essentially set the stage for this kind of colonial effort in, in Palestine. They recognized it. They approved of it because they viewed uh, Muslim people as being subhuman. That is, Zionism easily gained approval in the West because they did not think Arabs were human. It would learn about Arabs through recently immigrated European Jews who assumed a moral righteousness because of their true historical uh, persecution. Like, I mean, they went, they, they were an oppressed, and very much still are, an oppressed group. And so it made it difficult to criticize them when they went to... Uh, Palestine and, and inflicted harms against Palestinians. So there was like a mutual in the West. There was like it was like an uh, okay, we feel kind of responsible. So okay, but okay, it's against Muslim people that you're now inflicting this harm. We don't like them either. So that'll be fine. I mean, why wasn't Jewish resettlement happening in I don't know Texas? A lot of land there, right? You know, why not? Would the Texans have liked that? I'm sure they would have loved it. I'm sure they would have loved it. Now, I mean, I think it's so important. We can hold space to acknowledge both anti-Semitism as a real, historical, and present-day parasite on the planet, and we can acknowledge Israel's violences against Palestine and Palestinians, and we can fight against conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists who deny the Holocaust as just a fiction to justify Israel's settlement in Palestine. So, for example, Saeed provides an important corrective here, that Western support for Israel uh, was motivated by their desire to conquer 
the Orient. So, I mean, I study conspiracy theories, it's my thing. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories have such a long history from blood libel to well poisoning. Jewish people have historically been subject to conspiracy theories blaming like famine, turmoil, mysterious deaths, just blaming them on Jewish people to have an easy answer, to provide an easy answer for these complicated or inexplicable phenomena. Now, today, there's Holocaust deniers, and Holocaust deniers, many of them, deny the Holocaust and say that it was concocted by Jewish leaders to justify the creation of Israel. Now, obviously, none of that is grounded in reality. N no part of it. <laughs> there's no part of the Holocaust that was fabricated. Six million Jews, however many thousands, tens of thousands of Roma people, disabled people, were all subject to the concentration camps and eradicated by the Nazis. Now, what these conspiracy theories do beyond perpetuating historical leg anti-Semitic legacies against Jewish people, what they also do is erase European culpability within Israel's creation, where by, by branding it as this conspiracy, what it does is it erases the complexity around the situation where uh, Jewish settlements within Palestine met very little resistance because they were borrowing from legacies of European colonialism. So these conspiracy theorists, instead of grappling with that fact and how this is very much indebted to legacies of European colonialism, make it into a simple solution where, oh, it was a fabrication by Jewish leaders, which dovetails with uh, older legacies of, of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. They reduce this complicated possible analysis in favor of a simplistic one to continue these legacies of anti-Semitism against Jews. Now, many early Zionists, like many other colonizers globally, they claim to deliver the Arab people from the chains of superstition and tyranny and to expose them to the spectral light of liberal democracy. So while many, uh, while many liberals were prepared to critique other colonial projects, like especially the liberal intelligentsia in the U.S., who were so willing to critique uh, South African apartheid, critique America's long legacy of colonialism or European colonialism, they, you know, they were silent when it came to Israel and its treatment of Palestinians, and, and largely continue to be silent, probably, and it, I think it's out of fear, because there are real material, like, physical threats posed if you stand with Palestine. You just lose your job, or be denied the opportunity to get a job. Like, that is the state of things. You can't even criticize it. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. Now, moreover, in the, you know, leading up to 1948 and Israel's formation and afterwards, there were many liberal Zionists out there who were justifying Zionism because apparently because Arabs were anti-Semitic and therefore they had to, it's almost like they had to be punished for this. Now, obviously this isn't true because, I mean, and this, and the whole thing with like Netanyahu blaming the Holocaust on Palestine and Palestinians, it's a kind of like, it, it kind of uh, defangs and whitewashes Nazism, like how bad the Germans were and how bad the Nazis were to make, to make it seem as though Hamas is worse, or, which blows my mind. Uh, but in, in any case, now, obviously, this isn't true that Arabs are anti-Semitic. Like, and remember, and this is the way that this is often framed today. It's like anti-Semitism is a global thing of like the West and Europe. But for, it's It's a so it's like everywhere and it's a parasite and the way that it's localized and focused on in the Orient, quote unquote Orient, is just a way by which to erase its presence everywhere else, I think. So Saeed asks how much of Palestinian resistance to Zionist col uh, colonialism within Palestine, how much of this is motivated by anti-Semitism and how much of this was motivated by anti-colonial struggles, which were just then branded is anti-Semitism. Now, it wasn't just liberal academics or liberal Zionists or just Zionists in general. The Western media class participated heavily in this. They branded Zionism as an arm of Western liberal democracy and Arabs as anti-Semitic Nazi-supporting um, 
like uncivilized people caught in the past. They're too stuck in their traditions. They love authority. They love authoritarianism. They can't think for themselves, yada, yada, yada. And this plays out in all media that come out of the West. Like, you know, you think of the terrorist, what image comes to your mind immediately? Who in many films in the 80s and 90s in the US were the bad guys? It's often Muslim people. And as we see today, the media class is absolutely necessary to manufacture consent for Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory. As soon as anyone takes what I think five minutes or less to read up on this, to know, learn about the history, I think that they'd, they'd like, they'd side with the Palestinians and be like, actually, this, this is kind of unfair. This is unfair historically. But the entire media class, the entire entertainment industry has participated because of their own hatred of Muslims has participated in this or just not talked about it at all. And so when the international community recognized Palestine's self-determination in the 1960s and the reality of Zionist occupation was plain to see, the media class, echoing Israeli political leaders, called the occupation cooperation. Very interesting use of language, like how Israel's bombardment of Palestine daily, of Gaza, and, and the West Bank daily, this is branded as a war. Like as though these are two equally, equal-sized opposing sides fighting one another. And then you just take one minute and find the footage of people in Gaza waiting desperately among rubble and destroyed buildings for some amount of aid to be dropped in to avoid starving to death. And it's like, hmm, are we seeing the same thing in Tel Aviv? Or are they all chilling out in their cafes and going to nightclubs every night? I, I mean, it's like, maybe, I don't know. Maybe a war is not the right word to describe this. So the Western media class is extremely culpable in this. In 1976, for example, the New York Times critiqued, I quote, Arab propagandists who opposed the occupation for failing to see how it was, the quote ended after propagandists, new quote, how, uh, how Arab propagandists and the occupation was a model for future cooperation between Arabs and Jews, which is like, hmm, I wonder if they ask any Palestinians about that. You know, how many of these news articles are actually done, you know, news journalism likes to brand itself as being objective, you know, two sides. Like if there's a topic about trans people, for example, they have to get someone who thinks trans people don't exist and then, and then a trans person and then they have balanced journalism. I'd love someone to do a study to see how many times the New York Times, the Washington Post, or CNN has done a story about Israel and Palestine and given equal weight to Palestinian words as Israeli words. I, someone should go do that study if they, or if it exists, send, send it to me. I'd like to know how many times they've done their balanced, objective, neutral journalism. Now, this isn't just some, like, discursive postmodern battle of words in the West, though. Showing support for Palestine produces real material effects. Like I said, you lose your job, you're denied a job, you wind up a target of the Anti-Defamation League, or like Mothers Against College Anti-Semitism, or Canary Watch, where you end up on some list, and your like updates about your life are added, so you know you can be branded as, a, as an anti-Semite for the rest of your life. Not to mention the ways that Jews are treated if they criticize Israel. They're told they aren't real Jews. Their family, if their family are hardcore Israel supporters, their family might cut ties with them. They don't deserve to be a Jew. Like, you should really, if you haven't, go watch Israelism. It paints this picture very well. Zionism is about power, I think. I think it's about power. Not Judaism in the way it's uh, prepared to discount Jews who don't agree. Like, if, if, if a Jewish person doesn't agree, then their Judaism is then put, is interrogated. Like, how could, you, how could you say that if you're a Jew? Or the treatment of Orthodox Jews in Israel who are anti-Zionist or anywhere else. Like, my God, it's, it's horrendous seeing that footage of Jews being harassed by police for standing up for Palestinians. Like, it's... <laughs> And then, and then on the flip side, support for Israel means one's approval by the entire media and political classes. People will lap it up and applaud. 
Now, by way of historical evidence, Said cites Menachem Begin, who, I'm sorry about the pronunciation, the, uh, who, uh, Menachem Begin is one of the first terrorists in Israel. He was writing on the Deir Yassin massacre that he orchestrated with the National Mil Military Organization. So Menachem Begin, before Israel was a state, was a militia leader, and he would eventually become prime minister in the 70s of Israel. And he was responsible for killing. He killed many. He ordered the, the killings of many uh, innocent, innocent Palestinians. And Said identifies him as a terrorist. Now, in his book, this is Begin's book, The Revolt, he celebrates the massacre that killed more than 100 women and children and says that they can't be held responsible because they warned civilians beforehand with loudspeakers. This sound familiar? 30 years later, he became Israel's prime minister. But like I mentioned last time, I didn't know that this was all that was needed to justify murdering civilians. So if you warn them beforehand, then it's okay. I wonder, because I believe in rationality and equality, neutrality, objectivity, if Hamas had done loudspeakers before they did their attack, then Israel would have been like, oh yeah, that's okay. We can't, we can't use like the fact that they murdered babies, apparently, which has, has since been contended quite heavily. We can't use that against them because as, I mean here, as we know, it's okay when Israel does it, if they give them a fair warning, apparently. So this massacre that we're referring to uh, was the first Arab village captured by Zionists in 1948 under Begin's uh, command, the Deir Yassin, which is, is like <laughs> absolutely horrendous stuff. Now, despite innumerable examples like the, this, and we're going to go through more, Israel is often celebrated as a caring and humanitarian country by our political, military, and media classes. Strange that most, the, most other countries on the entire planet disagree and oppose Israel's onslaught of Palestine and Palestinians. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, I thought that we believed in international order and democracy. Like, why is that gone out the window when, when Israel enters the picture? You know, what, I, I believe firmly in, a, in democracy, and so apparently does the U.S. Like, why are they not listening to the international community? Now, when settlements first started popping up, when hundreds of thousands of European Jews arrived on in Palestine, begging to be welcomed there, many people became refugees. Many Palestinians, almost a million, lost their homes. They became refugees and they had to leave. Those who stayed lived and, and are living under an occupation which bre breaks international law about human rights. And the, primarily the two following laws, that everyone has a right to freedom of movement, which Palestinians do not. That is, unless you think checkpoints are freedom of movement. I'd like to try that in Texas, see how cool they'd be with checkpoints, uh, and see how fast they would revolt against that. Uh, and then everyone has a right to leave any country. Hmm. Does that apply to Palestinians, I wonder? If you're a Palestinian in Gaza, your territory is surrounded by a vast wall with two entrance and exit points. It has been described as an open-air prison. Palestinians in the West Bank are little... Are, are just a little bit more free to move, but not by much. A common point made by Zionists is that they left Gaza in 2005, though. This has often been touted, that they left Gaza in 2005. A few, 10,000 or so, uh, the number might be wrong. Let's say tens of thousands. Let's, let's be as generous as I think is possible. Israelis left Gaza. And this is often repeated to be like, oh, we left Gaza and then it fell into shambles and then Hamas took over and then it became a terrorist state, essentially. And they just conveniently ignore how Gaza never stopped being occupied. Even if the Israelis left it, it was put under serious restriction. It's like if a robber's in your house and they leave your house, but then they set up this perimeter fence around your yard and keep endless surveillance of you determining whether or not you can come in or out. They're like, well, we left. We're, we're not in your house anymore. We're not, even, we're not on your property anymore. We, would you be, I wonder if a Texan would be okay with that. I'd be very curious. Or Joe Biden. Oh, would Joe Biden be cool with that in his little Delaware house, wherever his, one of his many houses are? I'd be very, very curious if he'd be cool with that. 
I think that I think that any supporter of this has to go and live in Gaza for a little while and see see how how much they love it. Or, you know, they might get might die too quickly there. It, maybe the West Bank. You know, live in the West Bank a year. And then and then we'll see. We'll see uh how they feel about it afterwards. I think that that's fair. I think that, that would be a totally fair thing to do. And then everybody who's uh, who's opposed to Israel, they can go live in Tel Aviv and go to, you know, they can live in nightclubs and see if they change their mind and see if like, oh my God, like this is actually pretty great. It's almost like this is unjust. Now remember that uh, Said was writing this in the late 70s. And since 1948, so about 30 years, the UN, the UN General Assembly had called for Palestinians to be able to return home more than 30 times. Israel has refused. Israel has refused that. So Arabs lost their homes. They cannot sell their homes. And Israel promises every Jew that they may move to Israel. So if you are a Jew born in Chicago, you apparently have more of a right to Palestinian land than a Palestinian born in Nablus or Jaffa or East Jerusalem. Like, what? It's, it just it doesn't make sense. Now, in the late 1970s, it seemed like maybe headway was going to be made where the U.S. and Soviet Union recognized Palestinian rights with a big asterisk. I mean, basic human rights. It's so weird that they need to even be, quote unquote, recognized. I mean, don't we know from Kant that like every single human should be treated as an end in themselves and should be able to possess rights? Isn't that like moral philosophy 101? I don't know, maybe I'm just a hippie communist or something. But the U.S. backpedaled and nerfed what the implications of this declaration would mean uh, when American Jews, Israelis, and their allies, that is Zionist uh, Jews and supporters of Israel, and their allies inundated the White House with letters, phone calls, revealing that Israel is not enforcing a policy issue and that, like, essentially Israel is not a, a, a foreign international issue in the U.S., that it is a domestic issue in the U.S., that the U.S. almost has, like, some kind of strange obligation towards Israel as though it's, like, one of their own states. Where <laughs> I just found out that, Israel, you know, Israel has free health care, which I think is so funny. <laughs> Israel has free health care, and the U.S. is sending billions of dollars over there. And it can't, no, no free health care in the U.S. God, it's funny. Any criticism of, criticism of Israel was and is just simply immediately branded as anti-Semitism. Just, you know, you're the worst kind of person. You're there up there with the Nazis if you criticize Israel and the violence it's inflicting against Palestinians. And I think that Said says it best because he, he says, it so, says it so poetically. He says that to criticize Zionism now than is to criticize not so much an idea or a theory, but rather a wall of denials. To criticize Zionism now, then is to criticize not so much an idea or a theory, but rather a wall of denials. And I really had to sit with that. Like, wow. The denials being that Israel is committing any kind of violence against Palestinians. The denial that Israel is stealing people's land. You know, you know, it's this wall of denials. And I think this is this importantly distinguishes anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism. As we are seeing a rise of anti-Semitism today, with synagogues being vandalized, Jewish people being harassed online and in, in, in the streets, uh, with, with Holocaust denial, with, um, you know, people explaining this or, or blaming it on, like, Jewish control of the media, you know, classic anti-semitic tropes and you you name it i mean there's a veritable rise in all of these but these violent uh beliefs and ideas towards uh jewish people like no denying it absolutely it's a problem i think it is super important at this time that we do not conflate anti-zionism and anti-semitism because then we're just like anyone who's criticizing who, who's like standing for people human rights is branded as an anti-semite when there, there, there is an increase in anti-Semitism, like as though uh, Israel's encroachment on Palestinian territory is meant to satisfy some secret Jewish world order type agenda. Like, my God, 
Like we, of course we need to challenge that, hold those people accountable. Definitely. But it's hard to do that if people who care deeply about the Jews in their life, who, are, who aren't Jewish, or just Jewish people in general, are, can't even enter that space if they are also critical of Israel's treatment of Palestinians. So he ends the chapter by giving the pers- like what he hopes, what the goal is in talking about Israel and Palestine, what the goal is to, to create a more equitable world. And, his, and he says that his goal is for every person to live free from fear, insecurity, terror, and oppression, and free also from the possibility of exercising unequal or unjust domination over others. Now, obviously, this means different things for Israelis and Palestinians. For Israelis, it means freedom from anti-Semitism, as they should be free from it. They should be free from fear of Arabic people and free from Zionism as a program of oppression against Palestinians. Take note of that, the way that he frames this project for Israelis. And then for Palestinians, it is, or it means, freedom from dispossession, exile, historical marginality, and from inhumane attitudes and practices towards the oppressing Israel. And is the fear the same here? You know, we can't just apply the same kind of metric here, given these vastly different histories, given the the varying degrees of support that Israel gets from the global West and North versus Palestinians that struggle night and day to get support, to have protection. There's a really beautiful moment, (laughs) although horrifying moment, in Franz Fanon's Black Skin White Masks, where he's standing on a train platform and he's describing this moment where he sees a little white child, and he's in France, and he sees a little white child looking at him with terror on the child's face. And in that moment, Franz Fanon is seeing a little white kid scared of him. And you know how Fanon feels in that moment? He doesn't feel shame. He doesn't feel pity. He feels fear. He doesn't have anything to fear from the child. Like, the child poses no immediate threat to him, but he knows that the child's fear is backed up by the police, by the entire political class, by every institution would be on that child's side. So when he sees that child's fear, he's seeing the fear in the face of all these other institutions. This is the same fear that pushes cops to commit acts of violence against black people in the U.S. You know, this fear, they say, oh, it's just an embodied response. So in this moment, there's two people experiencing fear and they are not equal at all. And it's important to interrogate that. It's important to see how fear is not just this blanket homogenous thing. And that puts us here to chapter two, Zionism from the standpoint of its victims. So no idea lives in a vacuum, obviously. Zionism has historically been celebrated as a pure idea to produce a pure state of Israel. Such beliefs erase the suffering required for Zionism to flourish and enact its vision, suffering of Palestinians. Like the Marxist notion of commodity fetishism, Israel's image depends on an erasure of the suffering and exploitation required to create it. So commodity fetishism from Marx is the idea that in order to buy commodities and to live in a world of circulating commodities, we need to erase the exploitation required to actually produce those commodities. Because you never really want to think about where your clothes come from, right? Or your food in the case of like factory farming. You know, otherwise people might be like, "Uh, I don't know if I like this. So we remain willfully ignorant, like in the case of Israel, where the violences that they've inflicted are continually erased, or we never hear about it. We never learn about it. Even though if you're in North America, your tax dollars are going to fund it, to support it. For example, the guy I mentioned last time, Menachem Begin, who celebrates uh, and is being celebrated for his militia groups which Saeed brands as a terrorist organization because they were out of state and they targeted civilians, who killed hundreds of civilians and displaced thousands more. Well-meaning liberals then have no issue criticizing, like I said before, the U.S.'s history of enslavement and genocide of indigenous people or South African apartheid, but won't criticize Israel despite the commonalities. Now, I fear the same was true during these other horrors, like there were the 
intelligentsia liberal class who are justifying it. They're totally fine with it. And now we're just continuing these cycles of oppression. We, we must break these cycles. Like we know that, like I said, we know that manifest destiny is wrong. Yet it's still used today. Like we hear it. You could you just find examples of it in the Israeli government. Like as though it is their God-given right to that land. So citing George Eliot's uh, Daniel Deronda, who was George Eliot was the pen name of Mary Evans because when women couldn't, they wouldn't be taken seriously if they were writing. Uh, so her pen name was George Eliot. Citing Daniel Deronda, uh, Said notes that it advocates Zionist settlements in Arab land under the pretense that the Arabs were uncivilized, undeveloped, and needed to be enlightened. Obviously, this was a common idea and still is today. But one of the not so common aspects is Zionism's equating Palestinians with pure evil akin to and even worse than the Nazis. Something that they keep, like, that you hear from the Israeli government concerningly often, like equating it or making it seem like they're worse. And I think this is part of that Orientalist effort to erase the fact that Nazism didn't happen in the Middle East, it happened in Europe. And anti Semitism was running rampant throughout Europe before the breakout of World War II and before the not like think of the Dreyfus affair that was in France like Hannah Arendt was was arrested in France as a Jew because she was a Jew there, there it's like the anti-semitism is this virus European virus it's not a Middle Eastern one yet yeah, you can find it there of course but the problem is that it's localized there as though it doesn't exist anywhere else now by framing the Arab world as violent tyrannical and civilized the West is able to distract from its own violences, its own lack of civility, its own violence, its own tyranny. There's no, there's no coincidence that Zionism took place alongside European colonization in Africa, India, and the Middle East. Zionism would begin with Theodore Herzl, who imagined a Jewish state in Argentina or Palestine or somewhere in Africa. And then the Nazis, their idea was... The, the, between 1939 and, and 1941, Eichmann and, and others imagined a Jewish state in Poland, which, which they actually kind of did, uh, which would then result in uh, the Auschwitz and the, and the extermination, or Madagascar. It's difficult to know whether they were actually taking the Madagascar idea seriously, though, but it could have been any one of these places. In any case, though, he was prepared to displace the inhabitants, that is Herzl, didn't matter where it was. They they just they were like, we got to go somewhere. doesn't matter who's there. We'll take their land. We'll take their, their resources. We'll take their buildings. doesn't matter because it's going to be ours. And he said that they had to be willing to do it discreetly and circumspectly in his own words. And this was made possible by the European logics of colonialism. But as the chapter suggests, this is Zionism from the standpoint of its victims and it isn't possible to understand Zionism purely by looking at its motivations. You have to also look at its victims and their experiences. Whether, what other things are defined purely in terms of whom they, they benefited? Like, I thought we were, we're here to be good journalists. We're going to take both sides. We have to be neutral and objective. Historically, though, this is what European colonialism has done. It's erased the voice of the people they've colonized. It's like Gayatri Spivak's idea can the subaltern speak? To which her resounding answer is no, because they are denied a voice in the face of their oppressors. Now, of course, in all of this, science also plays a crucial role in justifying white supremacy and European superiority. Said notes how this played out in linguistics, where Indo-Germanic languages are associated with creativity, liveliness, and being aesthetically pleasing. Whereas, anti whereas Semitic sorry, languages like Arabic were viewed as programmatic, passive, and abrasive. So when European Jews were arriving in the Middle East, Europe looked upon them very happily because they were white passing. There were white people from Europe living there, speaking European languages. So they're like, of course there was this, the, the affiliated with them at the expense of the Arabic people whom they had this long history of dehumanizing. European uh, Europeans used ideas like these to justify colonization, and when hundreds of thousands of white European Jews arrived in Palestine, European rec Europe recognizes them 
as superior to the Arab population. So in this case, just alongside European colonialism and their logics of Orientalism, any Palestinian resistance is used as evidence of their being uncivilized or backwards, which is a very clever trick because Israel is then allowed to, they can do anything. They're allowed to defend itself by destroying civilian homes in Gaza and killing more than 30,000 people, including not even Gazans, aid, people delivering aid they can kill. But Palestinians are not and have never been justified in their efforts to defend themselves. Like, it's, it's amazing. It just blows my mind. For October 7th, Israel is allowed to kill more than 30,000 Gazans. But at any point that Palestine has resisted European or European Israeli occupation, then it, they're evil. You know, pure evil. They're not never allowed to defend themselves in any case ever. Take these words by Israel's 1973 governor or general, uh, gen governor, their general, military general, Yor Efrati. When our forces encounter civilians during the war or in the course of a pursuit or a raid, the encountered civilians may, and by the halakhic standards, halakhic refers to the Jewish law alongside scriptural law, by these standards, even must be killed. The civilians must be killed whenever it cannot be ascertained that they are incapable of hitting us back. Under no circumstances should an Arab be trusted, even if he gives the impression of being civilized. Yeah, these are real words, yeah. Amazingly, we see similar themes in Israeli uh, children's literature where Arabs are often de they're demonized endlessly, like just uh, depicted as being, you know, these anti-Semitic mob trying to kill every single Jewish person they can. And in the face of this power, I don't think, I don't think that rationality is, is enough. The international courts are not enough. The international community's support for Palestine is not enough. Politely asking is not enough. Israel will continue to expand into Gaza and the West Bank. At the time of this of the book, in the late 70s, Israel had seized 27% of the West Bank and then 16% more between the book's publishing and, and 1993. But, like, what, re like, Palestinians, they can't appeal to the, it doesn't matter, they could have the entire international community on their side except for the U.S., and still they're being bombarded daily. And it's like, what kind of resistance do they have? Like, what options do they have realistically? Like, what options are out there? I'd love someone to, to tell me. And as Israel has encroached more and more and gotten more militaristic with their checkpoints and surveillance and policing of Palestinians, they have also grown more conservative and ramping up these efforts, gotten more hostile, set up more settlement, illegal, internationally recognized illegal settlements in the West Bank, as though the threat has increased. Of course, Palestinians can't pose any resistance. They have to accept the bare minimum with a smile while the Israeli regime enjoys everything the territory offers. Now, of course, racism is at play here. It is also found in Israel where European and white passing Jews have historically held most political power and cultural power over non-white uh, Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews, for example, in Israel. It's not all the case everywhere, but I think it's important to also understand the connection between white supremacy here and these violences. And yeah, that'll put us into chapter three toward Palestinian self-determination. If you like what I did, you, know, you can like, share, subscribe, stay tuned for more. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be covering Hannah Arendt after this book. And um, yeah, if there's anything I got wrong, I mean, I, it, a lot of history stuff, I could have just gotten something wrong. I'd love to know about it. I would definitely correct anything or make Make it known that I that I got that I got some fact wrong or some bit of information. I'd love to know about it. And yeah, on that note, uh, take care and contribute and help where and how you can. Even if it's just not sharing this, but go and share Palestinian voices, perspectives, experiences, solutions. Now's the time to really amplify them. Like it's, I think that's the most important thing uh, beyond monetarily helping. And yeah. On that note, take care.